How do you persuade an audience? How do you convince them to feel a certain way or think a certain thought? For millennia, the answer has laid in three elements. And you were right. It was Aristotle. This is What is Ethos, Pathos and Logos. First, let's try to persuade you to subscribe to Studio Binder and click the bell to watch more of our videos. Did it work? On to our argument. Rhetoric refers to the way in which we communicate and often more specifically focuses on the art of persuasion. Well, why should I tell you? Maybe this will help. I still don't think I should tell you. Can you spot me a 20? How about now? All right, I'm going down to Ludwig's office. I'll find out if you're telling the truth. The study of rhetoric began in ancient Greece, where philosophers sought to understand how writing and speaking are used in different contexts. Ethos, pathos, and logos make up what is referred to as the rhetorical triangle, a rubric for persuasion laid out by the philosopher Aristotle in his work called Rhetoric. According to him, great speakers utilize each of these three tools to win an audience over and convince them of something. Ethos is a speaker's credibility, all the reasons why an audience should trust the speaker. These can be credentials, personal experience, you all know me, know how I earn a living, or endorsements from experts. This is Catherine Goble with our trajectory and launch window division. Her work is pertinent to today's proceedings. Pathos is the appeal to emotions. These are the ways in which an argument pulls at an audience's heartstrings and plays on our own deeply held beliefs. And tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Logos is the reasoning. These are the facts and how they are laid out. In other words, the structure of the argument and the evidence that backs it up. Now, a clever man would put the poison into his own goblet because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. I'm not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you must have known I was not a great fool. You would have counted on it, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. Today, the rhetorical triangle can be found in everything from political speeches to commercials, documentaries, and more. Understanding the rhetorical triangle will make your arguments stronger and also make you cognizant of when the devices are being used on you. All very convincing, but for one obvious fallacy. Let's look first at ethos. Establishing credibility is a crucial component of persuasion. She really is a genius. I'll read that bit again, shall I? In Greek, ethos can be roughly translated to mean moral character. And indeed, this is where credibility can often be found. But I can tell you this. He won't sell anybody out to buy his future. And that, my friends, is called integrity. Aristotle outlines three elements of ethos. The first is phronesis, which refers to a speaker's perceived intelligence. Calm down, Mike. I think Mr. Wonka knows what he's talking about. No, he doesn't. He has no idea. You think he's a genius, but he's an idiot. In other words, if you establish yourself as knowledgeable, an audience will be more likely to trust you. I'm not a cripple, I'm a scientist, and I'm the world's foremost authority on herpetology. That's reptiles, for those of you who don't know. In documentaries, filmmakers often use experts to add legitimacy to their argument. In 13th, Ava DuVernay brings in a variety of seasoned activists and scholars to add weight to her portrayal of racial inequality. You are basically a slave again. The 13th Amendment says that, hey, except for criminals, everybody else is free. Well, now if you're criminalized, that doesn't apply to you. They were arrested for extremely minor crimes like loitering or vagrancy. 
and they had to provide labor to rebuild the economy of the South after the Civil War. Movie trailers will often underline Phronesis by emphasizing creatives in film who have a proven track record. The trailer for Megalopolis, for example, boasts Francis Ford Coppola's name, since audiences respect his body of work. Personal experience also counts as Phronesis. In her address to the UN Youth Assembly in 2013, Malala Yousafzai used her experience as a survivor of an assassination attempt to advocate for girls' education in Pakistan. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. Education is the only solution. Education first. Thank you. The second element of ethos is arete. This is the moral value of your argument. To persuade an audience, it's important to lay out why what you're saying is morally sound. You drop a bomb that falls on the just and the unjust. I don't wish the culmination of three centuries of physics to be a weapon of mass destruction. Lawyers use this technique all the time. A fictionalized version of this rhetorical technique is used in Atticus Finch's argument in To Kill a Mockingbird. He uses the morality of a court of justice to persuade the jurors. In this country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. The final element of ethos is eunoia, which refers to your mutual understanding with the audience. In other words, this is a speaker's likability and accessibility. Mum fancies him. This can be found all over advertising in the form of celebrity endorsements. A celebrity may not be an expert on the product they are selling, but the ad relies on their eunoia. The audience likes the celebrity and will, therefore, listen to what they have to say. Without ethos, an audience may dismiss an argument outright. Mayday, mayday, anyone copying Channel 9? Terrorists have seized the Nakatomi building and are holding at least 30 people hostage. Attention, whoever you are, this channel is reserved for emergency calls only. Don't oh, lady, do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? Our next element of the rhetorical triangle is equally important, pathos. One of the best ways to persuade an audience is to move them emotionally. This is where pathos, which roughly translates to experience or emotion, comes in. One surefire way to create pathos is by including empathetic characters in your argument. If an audience can put themselves in a character's shoes, they are more likely to understand the argument being made. In Fruitvale Station, Ryan Coogler depicts Oscar Grant as an immensely relatable man to make the message of his film pack more of a punch. Coogler explains his use of pathos. I wanted the audience to get to know this guy, to get attached, so that when the situation that happens to him happens, it's not just like you read it in the paper. When you know somebody as a human being, you know that life means something. Pathos can also be built through sympathetic characters, or, in other words, characters an audience feels concerned for. In his I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King Jr. invokes the lives of young children to drive his point across. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. 
By juxtaposing the vicious racists with sympathetic boys and girls, King implores his audience to root for the side of racial equality. <laughs> An audience can also be emotionally affected by vivid imagery. Detailed descriptions can force an audience to see the real-world implications of an issue. With his seminal film, Titicut Follies, documentarian Frederick Wiseman pushed for the reform of psychiatric hospitals without uttering a single word. Instead, he simply showed audiences the dismal conditions of the facilities to elicit horror and shock. Pathos can also be built through analogy, a lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of a sheep. If a thesis is too complex or large for an audience to grasp emotionally, a speaker can liken the idea to something more relatable and understandable. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. In Independence Day, President Whitmore's speech uses this technique to ground the film's extraterrestrial stakes. In less than an hour, aircraft from here will join others from around the world. And you will be launching the largest aerial battle in the history of mankind. In his soliloquy, he likens the impending battle with aliens to America's fight for independence. Perhaps it's fate that today is the 4th of July and you will once again be fighting for our freedom. Not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution, but from annihilation. This strategy stokes Americans' patriotic sentiments and applies that pride on a global scale. And should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight, we're going to live on, we're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Pathos is the beating heart of an argument, but an argument that solely relies on pathos can run the risk of being manipulative and misleading. Raise number two. Look what I can do. <laughs> but well, what does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. Let's look at an argument's brain. Logos. Most good claims are backed up by facts. Logos refers to this element of an argument, as well as how these facts are laid out. The most obvious way to bolster a position's logos is by doing research. In An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore and his team inundate the audience with statistics and, importantly, present them in a clean and easy-to-digest manner, employing graphs and comparisons. To make a thesis stronger, an argument can also address both sides. This lets an audience feel as though you are taking into account any potential refutations, making your argument feel more bulletproof. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not SHIELD. It's not Hydra. No, but it's run by people with agendas, and agendas change. That's good. That's why I'm here. When I realized what my weapons were capable of in the wrong hands, I shut it down and stopped manufacturing. Tony, you chose to do that. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. In The Wind That Shakes the Barley, Ken Loach shows both sides of the factions that arose in the Irish resistance to the British Empire. Both Teddy and Damien explain the reasoning behind their positions. We took it from the British with force. And the first judgment of this, an independent court, you have undermined by deciding to settle it in a pub. He provides us with money to buy weapons. There's a consignment sure coming in. There is a off. consignment coming in from Glasgow in the next few weeks. You tell me how I'm going to pay for that if he's sitting down in the cell sulking. And we, what's going to we should enforce the court's decision. In the end, it is Teddy's side who wins. But through Loach's use of pathos, the audience is aligned with Damien. It's not too late, Damien. For me or for you. By addressing both sides, 
Loach creates what feels like a nuanced and fair argument for Damien's beliefs. The structure of an argument is also under the purview of logos. A good structure will ensure that a claim will make its maximum impact. In Spotlight, the true number of abusive priests slowly rises throughout the film. My estimate suggests 6% act out sexually with minors. Uh, 6% of what? 6% of all priests. How, how many priests do we have in Boston? About 1,500, 1% is 15, 6% is 90. This makes the final total all the more horrifying. A good use of logos also avoids logical fallacies. Really? And, the, and the name for this fallacy is called Golden Age Thinking. Ah, touche. Some common fallacies include a straw man argument, where a speaker misrepresents the opposite side. Martin Luther claimed the Catholic Church used this style of attack toward him, remarking, they assert the very thing they assail, or they set up a man of straw whom they may attack. Another logical fallacy is the false dilemma, where an argument claims that there are only two options, when other options in fact exist. Anakin Skywalker uses the fallacy here. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Circular reasoning is another logical fallacy, where two claims rely on one another to be true. In Idiocracy, Joe is subjected to this fallacy. Brando's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Do you even know? It's what they use to make Brando. Yeah, but why do they use them to make Brando? Because Brando's got electrolytes. After several hours, Joe finally gave up on logic and reason and simply told the cabinet that he could talk to plants and that they wanted water. Now that we have an understanding of ethos, pathos and logos, let's look at the three pieces of the rhetorical triangle working together in a real-world example. The rhetorical triangle is perhaps most brazenly used in commercials which need to persuade an audience extremely efficiently. A viewer needs to understand the message and why they should buy into it. An especially effective use of ethos, pathos and logos can be found in this anti-smoking ad from the CDC. The most self-evident component of the rhetorical triangle is ethos. I'm Mary, and I use the me as Terry is a former smoker who is now suffering from cancer. She therefore has intimate experience with the effects of smoking. Pathos is also present. I want to give you some name about getting ready in the morning. Love your name. The ad uses vivid imagery as Terry gets ready for the day, showing us how her throat cancer has severely affected her. Then your head really divide. And now you're ready for the bag. The spot ends with logos, presenting the audience with the fact that smoking causes damage to a person's body. Together, ethos, pathos, and logos make this CDC ad deeply moving and persuasive. The next time you need to change someone's mind, Think about how you can employ the rhetorical triangle, using pathos, ethos, and logos to create a well-rounded argument is sure to at least make your audiences stop and think. Want to create a persuasive film? Start writing out your next argument with StudioBinder screenwriting software. Remember to subscribe and enable notifications to see more filmmaking videos. And check out the StudioBinder Academy channel for tutorials and in-depth interviews. That's all for now. We hope we've persuaded you. I believe you've just won your case. Ms. Woods, you did well today. Really? You're applying for my internship, aren't you?